Hello, everybody. Hopefully you can see us both okay. Welcome. We're very excited to have you. Um, I'm Joanne Levy, and this is Jennifer Nielsen. Hello, and so excited. Hello, exciting. So we're going to start out with a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we're going to start our presentation with icebreakers so you can get to know us a bit because um, we realize that you may not know both of us or either of us, I guess. Um, then we're going to chat about our respective books and then we're going to answer lots of questions. And we're also going to be giving out prizes throughout. So make sure you stick around to the end. If you do win, we have your email on file and we will contact you using that email that you used to register already and give you a chance to give us our ad your address so we can send out your prize. And thank you to everybody who submitted questions. We got tons of questions, well over a hundred questions. And everybody who submitted a question in advance, even if we don't get to your question, you're going to be entered in for a special door prize. So make sure you stick around to the end. And feel free to use the Q&A to ask new questions if you haven't already asked them. And we're going to be answering live questions uh, as much as we can. And if, if you see in the Q&A that something you wanna know um, has already been asked, you can upvote it. So that means it shows us that it's just more important for more people who wanna know the answers. So upvote questions that you want to see. And I see there's already a question in there, thank you. Um, yeah, so I think that's it for the housekeeping. So we're gonna start with a little bit of an introduction. So I'm gonna introduce Jennifer first. Jennifer Nielsen was born and raised in Northern Utah where she still lives today with her family. She loves collecting old books, enjoys any time she can get in the mountains and always welcomes a recommendation for a great movie. Jennifer spent her early years reading and her teen years acting. So looking back, it seems inevitable that one day she would be creating stories of her own. Her latest release is Rescue, her 20th novel since first becoming published a little more than 10 years ago. Jen's favorite independent bookstore is King's English Bookshop in Salt Lake City. All right, awesome. Well, it is my privilege to be able to uh, introduce uh, my friend and fellow author, Joanne Levy. Um, Joanne Levy's love of books began at a very early age, raised by voracious readers. One of her favorite childhood memories is of weekly trips to the bookstore with her mom. Joanne can usually be found at her computer, either creating spreadsheets, sometimes just for fun. And guys, she is not kidding about that. That is like a legit um, like source of entertainment for Joanne is organizing chaos um, or channeling her younger self into books. She lives in rural Ontario, Canada with her husband and kids of the furred and feathered variety. In her non-writing time, Joanne enjoys working with wool and very sharp needles to make felt creatures. Joanne's favorite independent bookstore is a different drummer books in Burlington, Ontario. Thank you. Awesome. So we are actually going to start with a giveaway. So hopefully you can see that. Our first giveaway, courtesy of Orca Books, my publisher, is My Best Friend is Extinct. So Jen, I'm going to ask you to choose a number between one and, what did I say, 187. All right, that's, uh, that's gonna be, and I'm just listening here to like the muse, which says 86. 86, 86 is Ollie, O, oh, and that's O with is the last initial because we were respecting people's privacy. And I'm going to write that in. Congratulations, Ollie. You get my best friend is extinct. Which you're going to love. That is awesome. Uh, awesome. So next, we are going to go on to the icebreakers. So what did you look like when you were your character's age? This is us. <laughs> Aren't these the cutest pictures? I love these pictures. I love them too. I feel like, I feel like you just look like so, you're just so summer camp ready. I have clearly no clue how to wear a feather. 
um, in one's hair. And if you were to scroll down, I'm wearing a dress that's the super awkward dress. And I've got bruises all up and down my shin because I had no business being in a dress uh, back then. So, but you look like you just fit exactly as you should. It's, uh, I, I'm pretty sure this was taken at summer camp. So um, yeah, I fit the part and I'm not exactly sure how old I was. I was probably 10 or 11 at the time. So yeah, that's me. Yes. So moving on, tell us a fun fact about you. Why don't you go first, Jen? <laughs> All right. I was thinking about this and this is one, I'm sorry, I got to adjust like it's sunset. So the sun is going to be constantly adjusting here. I did not know whether I should confess this or not, but I'm going to, it is totally. absolutely true. I have eaten food off of a stranger's plate in a restaurant uh, based on a dare and for $50. So $50, $50, totally. it. well, it wasn't even about the money. It was about, if you're going to dare me, I have to do it. Yeah, so yes, sure. I've eaten food off of a stranger's plate. I am that person. That is, that is that's awesome. awesome. What was it? Uh, French fry. Nice. Went and took one. Very cool. So my fun fact is that despite being taught by no fewer than two professionals, I can't juggle. Um, <laughs> my husband will attest to this. And actually there's video of it of me on a cruise ship being taught by a professional juggler. And all I can do is throw the balls over my shoulder. I'm just, I cannot juggle. So. I, I can't either, so I can't judge. <laughs> yeah, so that's me. That's my fun fact. Next up we have, if you could have a superpower, what would it be? Mm, for me, time travel. Like that would really help out the historical research. And I also think it would just be awesome. How about you? Yeah, that's awesome. Mine is a little more mundane. I would like to be um, like bewitched and be able to do this and clean my house. <gasps> that would be my superpower. I didn't even think about that. Oh, that Did you want to awesome. change yours? No, I'm still committed to time travel, <laughs> but I would borrow you and your magic. I would, I would clean your house. How's that? Yes. Awesome. And then I would, uh, you know, go into the future and mess it up again so that I could get your help multiple times in one visit. Well, don't, don't abuse it. <laughs> I know there's you can push it too far. Next we have what would the title of your autobiography be? Okay, this um I this my my uh, autobiography would be called Tripping on Stage. And uh, not only because I've literally done that, but because I'm generally kind of a clumsy person and I feel like most of my life it's just kind of tripping my way through life and uh trying to learn to balance. And I've literally tripped on stage. Very cool. Well, so it's apt. Mine would be, um, I love spreadsheets and other dorky things about me. <laughs> Which feels, you know, right it on. Feels, it feels spot on. Yeah. See, you were right about the spreadsheets. If you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be? Oh my goodness. I would live right where I do. I love where I live. I'm right in the mountains of Northern Utah in a small town. We have more cows and chickens than we have people and it's just as we want it. I am exactly where I want to be. How about you? Awesome. Well, I kind of like being in the country where we are, but I have to say I would live on a cruise ship if I oh. could uh, be anywhere because I love being on the water and I like going to other places, but only unpacking once. Yeah. So, and somebody um, else books. Yeah, exactly. And my husband and I talk about how we will retire on a cruise ship someday if we can ever get back on one. That would be awesome. Nice. Yeah. Nice. By the way, everybody, I'm following your comments and your answers in chat. They are fantastic. So keep them coming. Which is great because I can't see the chat. Oh, they <laughs> I don't are. Know where it is. <laughs> they are just rolling with awesome. Good. Good. So I should tell you, Jen, I can't see the chat. So if there's something that comes up for me, you should let me know, please. I will. <laughs> okay. So now we're going to start moving towards talking about our books. So summarize your book in six words. Can you do it? I can do it. Secret code. Oh, secret code. Dangerous mission. Save Papa. How awesome. about you? Mine is tween summer camp drama and friendships. So I can't imagine two more different books for the same age group. I know, and here we are like somehow doing this mashup. Um, shall I read a little bit from yours first? That would be lovely, thank you. 
I have to tell you, well, no, you go first because then I'm going to ask you questions. Okay. So you go first, then I'm going to dive right into questions. Well, why don't I, you know what, why don't I read yours before I ask you your questions? Okay, then I'm going to go straight. See, we're, yeah. despite Joanne's best attempt, she has me on board. So organization is a little, <laughs> uh, all right, I'm going to tell you all, this is Joanne's book, The Sun Will Come Out. I read uh, this as a very, very early draft. I loved it then. I love it even more now. Um, in my opinion, Joanne is uh, one of the finest authors out there for coming of age realistic novels. And, uh, and it's because she pours so much heart and emotion and honesty and realism into him that all of us feel like, yes, I was that character at some point. We just, uh, you cannot help but identify with her um, writing. And so uh, she has this, um, this wonderful character, B, B-E-A, not Beatrice, she doesn't like that. But um, Beatrice is spending some time in the infirmary for um, kind of an ongoing issue, but uh, she meets somebody new. And I'm just gonna read just a couple of uh, chapters, but I love it. She says, I opened my eyes and almost screamed. No, not almost. I did scream because there was someone standing my, by my bed staring at me. I blinked. What I was seeing wasn't really making sense. I figured I must be dreaming, but why would I dream about a tiny alien wearing a New York Yankees baseball cap and a Camp Shalom t-shirt? Sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. The words were spoken in a very high voice. Who are you? I asked. And from there, you would go on to meet one of my favorite characters in any book. I've read this uh, for a very long time. Thank you. He's, he's my favorite, too. Oh. <laughs> oh, I adore him, honestly. Like, we can't even talk too much about him. But just know, you will adore him. Thank you. Uh, jo Joanna, I do have some questions for you. <laughs> All right. First, um, B, as a character, she has a very strong, distinct voice like I said earlier, that, that young readers in particular are so going to relate to. Where did you find B in your imagination? I found B inside of me. And I didn't mean for that to rhyme, but there's elements of most of my main characters in all my books are an element of me. And B um, is very close to home because I grew up pretty shy. Um, I never had uh, hives, B ends up with hives, um, you know, when she goes to camp, but I was pretty stressed out meeting new people and new situations. And I, I was able to channel that um, for this character pretty closely. She, um, yeah, she's me. I G, B is me. B is you. B is me. Um, which, uh, which leads to the second question. And one of the things that I really appreciated about this book is it is overtly Jewish without it being about being Jewish. It just B is a Jewish character. And I thought you wove in those Jewish themes so smoothly and seamlessly and, and you yourself are Jewish. And uh, so can you talk to me about the Jewish themes in this book about why was it so important for you to include that in this book? Yeah, for sure. Great question. And um... It is, it is a Jewish summer camp that B goes to, um, and she is Jewish. It's not a religious book, and I want, to, I want to point that out. It's not about religion. It's just her identity being a Jewish. She identity happens Jewish to be, girl. yeah. Yeah, and so there's two reasons that I, I feel it's really important for me to write um, Jewish characters in my books. Um, so the first being there weren't a lot of Jewish books when I was growing up for, for kids, books about Jewish kids. And I didn't feel seen a lot of times. Um, I didn't feel seen in my school when, you know, at Christmas time there was pageants and I, and you know, everything to do with Christmas and we decorated. And I still remember very distinctly sitting in the school gym, singing Christmas carols, thinking nobody's singing any Hanukkah songs. And I felt overlooked and, I wanted to see myself in books. And so for that reason, I want to show kids today that there are books about kids like them if they're Jewish. And, you know, I want them to feel seen. 
So that's my, my one reason. And the second reason is a little, a little more serious. Um, these days, you know, anti-Semitism, hate, hate crimes are really on the rise. And it's, it, it hurts my heart when I see, you know, hate crimes and graffiti and, and, you know, terrible things happening to people out in the world. And my answer to that is to build empathy through books. And there are lots of people out there who don't have Jewish friends, who have never met a Jewish person and don't really understand what it even means to be Jewish. And I want to put out there stories that show we're just like everybody else. We may pray somewhere else, we may eat different foods or, or wear different clothes sometimes or take different days of the week off, but we all wanna belong. We all wanna have friends and you know, live our lives. And I think that books for kids can really, really show um, people like that whole windows and mirrors thing. So kids that are non-Jewish can learn what it's like to be Jewish and Jewish kids can see themselves. So a long way around, but that's my two reasons for writing books about Jewish kids. And it's really, really important to me. And um, I don't know that I will go backwards and write less Jewish stories or, or I guess generic stories that don't have Jewish characters because even in stories that aren't about being Jewish can still have Jewish characters. So that's, that's sort of my jam. And that's, that's, and that's I think what I liked is that she just is. And, and so, you know, for, for young readers, it becomes this, oh, okay, well, that's, that's cool. And that's how it should be because we are a diverse world and, and becoming more diverse. And, and so to have a book that reflects it as beautifully as yours does is really, uh, really priceless, I thought. Thank you. Thank you very um, much. Which leads me to the third question. And I think you've kind of alluded to it with your previous answers. Um, one of the trademarks of your writing is your honesty. Um, you are honest about emotions. You are honest about, you know, bodies and relationships and life and death, um, the ups and downs of growing up, all of these things. You are very, um, you're very honest in your voice. Um, why do you think it's so important to have these honest conversations um, be part of your books? Uh, first and foremost, because kids are smart. And if you're not being honest, they know it and they'll put your book down. And, you know, it's kids read to enjoy things. Kids read to see themselves. And I feel like channeling my tween into my books, even the awkward parts or maybe especially the awkward parts is how you really show kids that, the, that what they're feeling is okay and, and what they're worried about is okay. And it's normal and everybody worries about that. And there's a scene in this, in this book in the pharmacy where poor B is with her mother and her crush comes along and they're talking about changing bodies. And it's the most awkward, terrible scene so in the world. And it's funny, it's really funny. I mean, looking in on it, but poor B is just devastated. Um, but these things happen and it's real and it's real feelings. And I can remember feeling like that. And, you know, my mom, God rest her soul, had no, was never embarrassed about any of that stuff. So I could totally see being in that situation with my mom and her just, you know, talking about changing bodies and all that. So <laughs> it's, you know, this is real stuff. And, and if you're trying too hard or, or making stuff that isn't real, kids know. Kids know and they want to see truth. Yeah. 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 Um, Joanne, we've had a request in chat to make yes. our screens larger. Can we uh, bump away from the PowerPoint for a minute or we, we... Let's stop sharing. Yeah, let's just... that. And now I can see the chat. Yeah. Hi. And that way, oh, yay. And the chat is... And the chat's there. I mean, it's Although so... I... I've missed all these 138 messages. Oh my goodness. I Hi know. everybody. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. <laughs> Chet. So it's now my turn to read a little bit of Jen's book, Rescue. And I think it's pretty self-explanatory what I'm gonna read. Um, Mama once told me that surviving in an occupied country 
meant we had to learn how to live in the middle, somewhere between accepting our fate and outright resistance. With my next step, I left the middle. I was now an unofficial spy and part of the resistance myself. It was no longer my job to simply observe the enemy. Now I had to do everything in my power to sneak three innocent people into safe territory and somehow to also rescue my father. This is not the smartest thing you've ever done, Meg, I said to myself. And a voice quietly answered inside my head, nor is it the stupidest thing you'll do before this is over. I loved this portion of the book. It, it encapsulates so much of what the book is about and what you absolutely excel at with your characters. Um, and thank you, thank you, thank you for writing this book. Thank um, you. And this leads me into my first question, which is um, actually, I'm gonna go with question number two first. You write strong characters who often seem fearless or at least courageous. And I know that readers really look up to characters like that, like I do, and even strive to be like them. Is that a conscious thing for you or do you just naturally gravitate toward writing kick butt characters? I love this question, Joanne. Um, you know, when I was um, a young reader, uh, there weren't a lot of female main characters who were in danger and who were taking the lead. The females were generally kept to the side, you know, where it was safe. And, uh, and I so wanted stories where the female was um, in the danger and she was solving it because that's, that's who I wanted to be. And I discovered A Wrinkle in Time by Madeline Lengel. And here comes Meg. And Meg was strong and she was odd and she had to go up against it. And it terrified me. It was such a scary sort of a villain to me. And there was Meg standing off doing everything she could to resist Meg. And Meg changed my life um, in that, um, in my young life because I so wanted to be her. And so I think it's interesting. I think you tend to write for characters where people can say, oh, that's me. And, and I write a lot for characters who are like, oh, that's who I want to be. And, uh, and so we're, we're writing to a similar sort of thing with just that slightly different uh, take on it. But, um, but Meg, um, she has her name for different reasons. But uh, when I linked her to Wrinkle in Time, her name always in the book was going to be Meg because of Wrinkle in Time. Cool. So and that's even more of an answer than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> and my next one is, I love, 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 and I wrote it three times because it's true, <laughs> that codes and puzzles were such a big part of this book. And as I was reading it, and even before I saw your author note, it reminded me of how when I was a kid, my dad and I, and I think my dad's in here somewhere. Hi, dad. My dad and I each did our own version of the weekly word puzzles that came in the newspaper. So I totally related to how Meg bonded with her dad over their codes. I imagine it was a lot of work to create these to align with the story. And what I'm curious about, and we actually had a few questions about this as well, what came first, the codes you had to write the story around or the story that you had to make the codes fit into? Yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I, you and I have a shared experience. So my mom is on here, hi mom. Uh, when the Sunday newspaper would came, uh, come, I would grab that back section that had all of the puzzles and word games and steal it away. And that was my Sunday afternoon is solving those. I loved that so much. Uh, when it came time to uh, create the codes, um, there is one overarching code that she's pretty much working on for the whole book. Well, I had to have that in place because um, it, it's pretty fundamental to choices she makes. The other codes I would create along the way, um, but, but th some of them are pretty complex. Like I have a new respect for people who are code creators because, um, because a lot of, of code making is misdirection. And, and so it's about not wanting the wrong person to see the code, but wanting the right person to be able to read it. And that was, it was fun. Like, I kind of want to do more code books just because I had a blast doing it. That's awesome. That's a, and those kinds of things can really add 
to the the depth of the book and the work that the author has to go through. Like even just little things like that that seem tiny end up being huge. Yeah. yeah. Lots of work behind the scenes. I remember there was one book I was working on where I had to create these books in a series that were within the book. And that took more time, I think, than writing the book was creating the backstory of these Lord of the Rings type books that the characters talked about. And, and anyway, it was very cool. Yeah, no, you're right. Very cool. So my next question is, you've written several historical fiction books based on true and very pivotal, pivotal moments in history from the rise of the Berlin Wall in A Night Divided, my favorite, I love that book, uh, Words on Fire about the Russian occupation of Lithuania, Resistance and Rescue about different parts of the Second World War. Tell us a bit about why you write historical fiction and what about these moments in history were so compelling that you had to write about them? And oh, this, I know this is a big, long question, so don't feel you have to write, you know, I know, I know, I'm not gonna you know, overdo. Um, there's a couple of reasons. Number one, I love writing about characters who think they are ordinary until they are uh, put in really extreme situations. And then uh, because things become so difficult, these ordinary characters become heroes. And I love kind of working with that process of watching heroes develop. Um, the second thing is the more that I study history, the more I realize history is not a line. It's not a line that starts here and moves here. History is a cycle. And the same things tend to happen over and over again. You talk about the rise of the anti-Semitism. We've been here before, right? And we know what's at the other end of it. That's why it's got to be fought. And so as we teach history, we teach people to identify where they are in that cycle. And if we know how we solved things before, hopefully we can prevent the problems in history. And, uh, and I know because that history also, learning history is comforting, that like, this is not the first pandemic we've been through. And so I know we're going to get through it because we've been through it before. And so I don't have to worry about the future because I know our past. That's why I love uh, writing history and that's why I choose the topics I do. Awesome, awesome. That was an excellent answer, thank you. Um, so next, I'm not going to bring back the PowerPoint because I don't think we need it at this point. Uh, but our next giveaway is for a signed copy of Rescue, the book that we're talking about. So I'm gonna go back to my spreadsheet and Jen, if you can please pick a number between, what was it, one and one, Yeah, this one is going to be 180. 180 is Patricia M S. Um, <laughs> Congratulations. Email address has uh, University of Reg Regina in it. So um, yeah, so congratulations, congratulations, Patricia. You know, just nice. that in. Get that right out, Patricia. Wonderful. Awesome. Yay. And I think, well, actually, we missed a giveaway. Actually, oh. we missed a few giveaways. Okay, so we better up? catch up. So yeah, next. <laughs> <gasps> we have so missed giveaways. We've missed giveaways. So let's catch up. So next is Scary Stories for Young Foxes. And Jen, is this a signed copy? This is a signed first edition copy by a Newbery Honor medalist, Christian McKay Heidecker, uh, who just won it this uh, last year. So this is a big deal book. Like you don't big want deal. it. You, I mean, you could make money on eBay, but don't. It's don't. just that good worth keeping. So what's your number? Who are, we, who are we gonna give it to? Three. Number three. Let's see, I have to scroll back up. Number three is LG. LG. So, okay, congratulations, L. Awesome. And the next one is the King of Jam Sandwiches, which I don't have it on screen. Oh, I don't remember where it is. Oh, here it is. By Eric Walters. This one was also donated by Orca. Thank you, Orca. So awesome. pick a number. 122. 122 is Bev Katz. Oh, sorry. I wasn't supposed to say your last name, Bev. Congratulations, Bev. She's actually an Orca author. Yay, oh, Bev. Very cool. Yes. 
Very cool. Keeping it all in the family there. Yes. Awesome. Okay. So let's But we do see have then. more books to give away. So we do. Yes. We were just, there are more. We were just catching up because um, yeah, we got behind. Actually, we have we have another one coming up now. Um, as we start in with our Q&A from the submitted questions, thank you all for sending in your questions in advance. And a lot of them were actually writing related. So what I've done is I actually purchased a copy of, um, and I don't have it with me, but it's called Dear Allie, How Do You Write a Book? And it's a book for kids um, with lots of contributors talking about how you write a book. Um, so I thought it would be apt. So let's give that one. By Allie this, Carter, right? Allie Carter, correct. Yes. And this so giveaway you. is specifically for the people who sent in submitted questions in advance. So please pick a number between 1 and 111. 49. 49 is, let's see, Megan Z or Z if you're in Canada. Megan, congratulations. Awesome, Megan. Book and I'm just putting your name in. Congrats, awesome. Okay, so now we're gonna start with the Q&A from submitted questions. So the first one is, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Srisha would like to know, and I love this question, in Double Trouble, which is my 2019 book, um, Joanne said if she created a sister, a fake twin sister, she would be like Jennifer, <laughs> which Aww. is you. So she wants to know, she, he, I'm sorry, uh, would like to know how long we've known each other. So that's a fun story. Jen, do you want to tell the story or shall I? Um, you know, why don't you run with this story while I adjust Thanks. the weird light suddenly okay. entering my office? Um, back, yeah, well, I guess, because I'm going to gush a little here, so it's probably better that I tell it but back I way back when when did false prints come out was it 2012, 2012. So? yeah so I picked it up um, and I started reading it and I fell in love with that book so much that I contacted Jennifer the author who I did not know at all and told her how much I loved the book and I gushed and gushed and gushed and fast forward to today we're best friends no <laughs> yeah no. Yada, 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 best yada, friends. Yada, 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 we're best friends now. <laughs> so um, we just became friendly over social media. I guess Twitter back then was our sort of social media of choice. And it turned out that we both were booked at the Tucson Festival of Books. And somehow, and this is completely by coincidence, we ended up presenting together at a school and couple other events I can't even remember um so hopefully this comes up did it come up it did the picture so here's us in 2013 together presenting um after getting to know each other through our books so we've known each other since about 2012 2013 so and we've only met in person a few times three two three three three, three? yeah but so definite friends, um, we just, I should say on this trip, um, Joanne color coded the whole trip. Like it was, it was so well organized. And I'm, yeah. I was kind of like, I'm going to get there and we'll wing it. And Joanne's like, no need to wing it. I color coded everything. <laughs> but I have to point out though, how much Joanne has impacted me. Cause right here, this is my timeline for my next historical. It's all color coded. So Joanne, has, uh, I've absorbed some of that uh, type A sort of magic. See, I use my powers only for good. <laughs> so that's how long we've known each other. So yes, and actually the, the backstory with this book is because we brainstormed, you helped me with some brainstorming and you actually gave me the idea for the, um, the fake twin story. It was a little bit different, um, but it changed, but that was, that was totally you. So okay. thank you for that. Oh, yeah. Fun. So the next question Kelly asks for Jennifer is Meg based off of you or based off on someone in your life? Uh, no. Um, you know, Kelly, I am horribly cruel to my characters 
And so I, I always keep them fictional because if, if it was based off of somebody I knew or myself, I would never be able to be as mean as I want to be. So my characters are always fictional so that I can be just a horrible, cruel author. And I just happened to glance in the chat and um, somebody said, Lee, Lee said, you are cruel to them. So it's so mean, you're so mean. Oh, and then is, somebody else said that Jaron is their book husband. Jaron would be honored. Yeah. Sincerely, he would he's be my, like- He's my book husband too, if I was a little younger. Yeah. Yeah, well, look, his <laughs> ego doesn't need any stoking. So we're not gonna tell him about that, but he would be honored. That's awesome, awesome. And next up we have Denise asks uh, for both of us, um, and this is a very common question that authors get a lot, where do you get your ideas? Do you wanna start with this one, Joanne? Sure, um, ideas are everywhere. Sometimes I get them in the shower. Sometimes I have to go looking for them. Sometimes they come to me fully formed. I can't give you a definitive answer of where I get my ideas, um, but everywhere. And, and I think the key is to be open to them because they will come at you when you may not have a pen and paper. Um, just be open, they're, I, they're everywhere is my non-specific answer. Which is actually very similar to mine. And uh, you know, I, I, when uh, something gets my attention for any reason, I just grab hold of that and immediately I start asking questions and all of the questions are designed to find story. And some of you have seen this example before, but it'll give you an idea of kind of what I mean. So I have this and I look at this pencil and I'm like, oh my gosh, do you know what an amazing story this will be? And you're like, well, Jennifer, that's a pencil. And I'm like, no, this is amazing if you ask the right questions, because what if the question is, what makes this pencil different from any pencil in the universe? Because maybe if I write something down and it happens, then this pencil can write the future. Or if I make a mistake, I can write it down and erase it, and then this pencil can change history. Or if I write Joanne's name and then I write something down, I can write ideas into her head, which means this pencil is mind control. And so it really doesn't matter where you start with your idea. It's all for me about the questions and coming up with the best answers I can. Awesome, that's an excellent answer. And Debra asks for me, if I owned my own summer camp, what would I name it? I would call it Camp Come As You Are. And that's exactly uh -huh. what it would be. See, I, I was thinking that. that. Yeah. I love that. That is so cool. Camp Come As You Are. Um, here's a fun question. Elisa asks, would the main characters from Rescue and the sun will come out, Meg and B, get along? Why or why not? I want to hear your opinion on this because I definitely have one. Well, they're such different characters. I think B would be extremely intimidated by Meg um, at first because Meg is so strong. Um, and Meg might be a little bit like, well, I don't want to say a bull in a china shop in, in B's eyes, but they're very different. So I think that, that B would be intimidated, but in the end, they would find things in common. And I think they would complement each other really well. So that's yeah. my answer. What's yours? I actually really agree. I think at first Meg would be just really frustrated with B. I think there would be a great deal of frustration, but I think B would step up and, uh, and soften Meg and, uh, and Meg would find she actually really needs B and what B contributes. So it would be a friendship story for them to learn to come together. Yeah, and they would, I think they would compliment each other. And they would, they would be great friends. Totally. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Cassie wants to know, what do you hope your readers take away from this book? Uh, do you wanna take that one first? I mean, this is, this is my general feeling is that, you know, when I write a book and, um, and, and it's finished and it's a final manuscript, I feel like it's only half there and there's nothing, it's just words on paper. And I feel like until the book gets into readers' hands, that's all it ever is going to be is words on paper. And then the reader gets it and opens it. And now it, it lives. Now the characters live forever because they are in a reader's imagination. And I think that a reader brings 50% of the book 
to what it totally will become. Uh, you as readers, you bring your imagination, you bring your background and history, and you will pull from the book what you need from it. And so what I hope is that you will read The Sun Will Come Out, that you will read Rescue, and that you will instinctively pull from it whatever you need in your life. That's, that's all I ever hope. What a smart answer. I'm going to decline to answer because I don't have anything that smart. <laughs> I read it on a meme. <laughs> no, I was just going to say for, for mine, I hope that people um, look for silver linings. You know, look for the good in, in, in things that may not seem great and yeah. maybe get out of your comfort zone a little. Yeah. You know, very simple, it. simple things. I love it. And we are starting, you know what? It's amazing how quickly time is going. So I might be a little selective with a couple questions that are coming up. Uh, I'm gonna skip that one. Uh, somebody asked if I attended overnight camp as a child and if so, uh, Christina asked this one. Um, and if so, how did that experience influ influence B's time at camp? Um, I had one, I went to summer camp overnight camp three years. Uh, one of my years was terrible. And this book was inspired by that terrible year and the meanings that I had to endure. So um, they say what doesn't kill you makes you stronger or you can put it in a book as an adult. So that's <laughs> how it influenced it. <laughs> um, and Elle would like to know if we weren't writers, what would we be? And I think I saw this also in the Q&A. So I'm going to take it out of there. But do you want to take that? What would you be if you weren't a writer? I would open a, I'm sorry, the sun, we're, our, it's like super cloudy and it comes in and out of the clouds. It's driving me nuts. Um, I would open a theater in the town where I live. I would teach theater and probably write the plays. So I would still be doing story, just performed story, not read story. Cool. And I would be, well, I need, I'd be an admin assistant, which I am in my day job. Um, I'd still write though. I mean, I'm, you know, even if I wasn't published, I'd probably still write stories. So I'd always be a writer in one way or another. Um, Cause I, if, if you're meant to write, you write. You yeah. Know. Yeah. Pretty Writers gotta write. It um, oh, it's giveaway time. So now we're giving away a signed copy of The Sun Will Come Out. So we're back to the full list. So Jen, if you'd like to pick a number up to 187. 156. 156 is Deb M. Deb Congrats, M. Deb M. Deb M. Uh, and if that's, if there's more than one Deb M, it's the um, read, read, write email. Oh, which I love even. Awesome. Yeah. So that's that. And back to our list of questions. So now I think we're going to look at a couple questions in the live chat. So let's go to the top, see what's been voted up. Um, this is fun. You're forced to spend quarantine with one fictional character. Who is it? Okay, uh, this one for me, just because I really want to, to spend some time with this character for myself. Scott Westerfeld did a fantastic series called Zeros, which has one of my all time favorite characters in it, Anonymous. Um, I would really love to, uh, to spend, if it's not a character I created, I would want to spend time with Anonymous because I would have a billion questions. Yeah, cool. And for me, well, you know, Harry from my book is fresh in my head and Jaron, because he's everybody's book husband, um, is fresh in my head. Or Anne from Anne of Green Gables, we'd be kindred spirits. Oh, you guys would. Yeah. People totally. would think we're sisters. Yeah. Oh, you, guys, you would hang out. Yeah. So, okay. So we answered that. Uh, what's, what is one of the most memorable encounters you've had with a fan? Oh, I have a good one for this. Go so for my first book, Small, Medium at Large, was on the Forest of Reading, which um, is similar to a, like a statewide reading list. It's our big one here in, in the province of Ontario. And... I was at the presentation and I had a signing line after the presentation and a, a young girl came up to the front of my signing line and she had my book cover 
on an iron on of her shirt. And I, I wish I'd seen this question earlier because I could pull it up. I asked her if I could take a picture. And she, just, I think she had decals of my book cover on her cheeks. And <laughs> it was just, she was fangirling and she almost couldn't talk to me. She was so excited. And I don't think she realized in that moment that I was feeling about her, how she was feeling about me. And if anybody out there thinks, oh, fangirling or fanboying over your favorite author is awkward, we feel the same about fans. I mean, I think I can speak for both of us, right? Like we think fans are rock stars. So that was my outstanding moment as an author that just was amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, some of you in the chat, you guessed mine. Um, it was right before False Prince came out and I was at Scholastic offices for a sales conference and uh, they put me in this room uh, to uh, the salespeople, like a group of them, we're going to walk into the room and meet the author and play a game. Well, this group of salespeople walked in and my publicist next to me, she says, welcome, welcome everyone. And this room is Jennifer Nielsen. And this salesman in the back of the room who had just walked in, he screams out, Jennifer Nielsen. And I'm like, <laughs> scared because who does that and then this guy starts running across the room for me and it's not like the cool run it's like this run <laughs> this man is running toward me but I'm already at the back of the room so there's nowhere to go and all of a sudden this man he grabs my shoulders and he starts shaking me which is whiplash and that's not good and he's like I just love this book so much and my publicist next to me she's pushing between this guy and me to get him off because at author events like these you were never supposed to kill the author yes and uh, trying to push this guy off and finally he did they played the game and went away but at the end of the evening we all met together for a supper and at the end of the supper um, there happened to be an extra seat beside me and he didn't sit he slumped in the seat <laughs> and he said I am so sorry he says I want you to know that in my whole entire life I've only ever assaulted two authors and the and other was Suzanne Collins well yes. so for the rest of forever I will always have in common with Suzanne Collins that we were both assaulted by the same salesman and uh, I wouldn't hilarious. trade you that's awesome. That's it awesome. Was, in hindsight, it was it was more fun than I make it sound now. Yeah. <laughs> I want to go back to the um, the submitted questions because we're running short on time, and there was a few that I know people are really going to want to hear the answers to. So, mm -hmm. um, and there is there's actually Jen. I don't think I told you this, but there are a couple other Canadian authors who have their launch directly after us. So I know there's going to be some people that are jumping from this one to that. So I, I don't hey, want to run too much. We have to be time. respectful. Absolutely. Yes. So, and this, this question I'd like you to answer, Jen, um, because I know you have the best answer there is. Uh, Stacy wants to know any words of wisdom to share with fellow authors about dealing with reviews. All right, I do. I have a, a very set answer for this one. This came when I was very early in my career from another author. And at the time, I didn't understand it and I didn't respect it, but I remembered it. And uh, I have come to believe this is an absolute truth. She said, um, good reviews are like crack and bad reviews are like poison and neither will help your career. And the good review, I mean, it feels great. The first time you read a good review of your writing, it feels awesome. And so what do you do? You go online and you try to seek out another great review, but it doesn't feel as good as the first review. It has to be a better, bigger review, or it doesn't feel as great. And so you become addicted to searching for good writers. And by doing that, you are feeding that kind of crack addiction and, it, and it, you will become slave to it because that's never why you got into writing. You got into writing because you love it. And uh, bad reviews are like poison. They will kill your love of writing and they will kill your enthusiasm and kill your confidence. And so neither one will do you any favors. So as much as possible, let the reviewers review and you write. Excellent. And, and I, the first time I heard you say that, which was only recently, um, it really spoke to me. So thank you for sharing that. I, I think that will help. There's a lot of authors in here and I think that will help a lot of people. So thank you. Yeah. Um, next, uh, let's see. 
Oh, we missed a we missed a giveaway. So oh. next giveaway is copy of the Captive Kingdom. Oh, pick a number. Okay, guys. This is the fourth false prince. I'm going to sign it and send it to somebody. What's your number? Oh yeah, um, uh, forty. Forty is is that Catherine P. Yay! Catherine P. Congratulations. Congratulations. Okay, and we gotta keep moving along. Um, let's see. Emily wants to know, how do you know, this is a hard one, how do you know if your book idea is worth writing? Um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, if you are, Okay. Yeah, I do. I do. Emily, if uh, it's keeping you awake at night, if you're thinking about it, if, if you are, um, if you love the idea, write it, write it. Like if you've got that personal passion, that personal excitement for it, just create it yeah. and see what happens. Um, because you're never going to know until you get into it, but why walk away from an idea just because you're, you have doubts, just, write some of it, do a, a test scene. And yeah. if you get more excited after the test scene, do more. And that's what I was going to say. If it, if it won't leave you alone, it's worth writing. If it's yeah. bugging you and keeping you awake at night, it's worth writing. If it's a story that nobody's told, it's worth writing. And even if it's a story that's been told before, nobody's written it the way you will. So yeah, nobody it's can. worth writing. Yep, absolutely. absolutely. Excellent answer. Uh, Lucky would like to know, what can you tell us about your upcoming books? Ah, do, you want to talk, do you want to do this one, Joanne? Start with this. Sure. Next, and this is very exciting because I just got the advanced copy yesterday. This is my next book and it's called Sorry for Your Loss. And it comes out in October and it is set in a funeral home. And for the grown-ups out there, I like to describe it as Six Feet Under meets Judy Bloom, And it's all about a girl and she, um, her family runs the funeral home and she encounters a boy who comes in after a terrible, terrible trauma um, and he's lost both of his parents and her family funeral home does the funeral. So um, it's how they become friends. And it's about grief and loss and what goes on in funerals. So it's kind of a, I pull back the curtain a little bit. Um, my dad runs a funeral home, so I've done my research and I'm hoping to actually put some research on my website very soon. So lots of pictures of interesting things in the funeral home. So that's next for me. Oh, and it's be... actually, it's up on Goodreads if you want to add it to your Goodreads. And it's also available for pre-order if you're so inspired. And what's the title again? Sorry for your loss. Sorry for your it's loss. Orca as well. Awesome. Uh, the one I'm doing next is called Black Ink. Some of you have heard about it. It is a uh, story about a boy who's in hiding from some very bad people, but he's not sure why, because he has no memory. He has no idea who he is, but that's okay. He has a Sharpie and uh, he can write on his forearm. And if what he writes is true about himself, it will stay on the surface of his skin. If not, it will soak into the skin and every day he writes down a different name and every day it soaks in. So he doesn't even know his own name, but on weekends he volunteers at the old folks home because if he, uh, he volunteers, then they feed him and his favorite game to play with the old folks is boggle. <laughs> so it's this dice game, you shake up the dice, they fall in a tray and you try to find out the words and just read the words there. Well, one day this boy shakes up the dice and when it falls in the tray, he reads out, they know you are here, go. Go. I just got chills. Uh, yeah, <gasps> so it's a story about a kid with no memory, but he's got a magic Sharpie and a boggle set that sometimes talks to him. Uh, that's the one I'm writing now. Shattered, um, Ca Shattered Castle comes out this fall. That's the fifth false prince. Uh, that's the next to release, but Black Ink is what I'm writing right now. Awesome, awesome, yay. And I think we're behind on giveaways and then maybe one more question. And then we have to wrap up because this has been the fastest hour ever. In history. Um, so next we have for the dictionary page, do, do you have that handy to show? Yes. We have a really cool piece of art that Jen made. 
Yes, but I will custom this to whatever you want it to say. This is mine. Words live, they have power, but we'll make it however you want. Awesome. Very cool. Pick a number, please. Um, 18. 18 is Bethany K. Yay. Yay. I think it might have been our first, like our top question answer. There. Yes. So, congrats. Yes. Dictionary page. Congrats, Bethany. And then our final two giveaways. Well, let's uh, let's answer one more question first. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see. If you could give a piece of writing advice to yourself when you were just starting out, what would it be? And that's from Jillian. Uh, for me, it would be break the rules. Break the rules. I was I was way too concerned about making my uh, language arts teacher happy that I wasn't making the writer inside me happy. So learn the rules, then break them. And then break them. And mine would be similar and be honest with your writing because if you're, if you're holding something back and not being honest, people will know and it won't be from your gut. And it's when you write from your gut, the honest stories that people notice and are like that, that I is what that. writing is supposed to be. So that yes, is thank you. Advice. Awesome. So our last two um, giveaways are one from each of us and they're free Zoom visits. And Jen, do you want to explain how this generally works? We'll contact you if you are a, a student or a younger person, you can donate it to a book club. You can walk in you know, tomorrow, tell your teacher, tell your librarian, hey, I won this. I have no idea what to do with it. Uh, you can donate it out. You can auction it off. What do we care? Um, if you are a parent, you can reach out and do the same. Um, or as a writer, we'll Zoom with your writer's group. We'll Zoom with, um, you know, you personally, if you just want some one-on-one -on -one mentoring time. Um, when you win it, we'll consult with you about what is the best way for you to use it, but it's yours. Cool. Okay. So we're, we're running short on time. So pick a number and then pick another number. The so we'll do the, the first one for Jen, a free Zoom visit with Jen. Okay, that is going to be number 90, 98. Is Adeline B. Nice, Zoom Adeline. with Jen and Zoom with Joanne. And 176. 176 is Kristen D. Nice. Congratulations, people. So I guess all that's left is to say thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody. If you have won a prize, we will be in touch. If not tonight, then first thing tomorrow um, to let you know how to claim your prize. And thank you. Thank you for thank being you. with us. And thank you, Jen. And thank you, world. And thank you all. And to those of you who are writers, keep writing and adding your stories. Those of you who are readers, we need you. And we appreciate you more than you know. So for you to take time out of your hour, it means the world to Joanne and I. And, uh, and we'll keep writing because we know you're out there reading. Yes, absolutely. And we are going, we are recording this. So we will have a link probably tomorrow. Um, if you have a burning desire to watch us again. Um, and thank you again. Thanks for being here. Right. We hope you love our books. Thank have you, a great everybody. Evening, everyone. Bye-bye.